back, everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified emotionally focused therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. And we have welcoming back to our show again, we have Dr. Ting Liu. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, as well as one of our certified emotionally focused therapy trainers. And she is the director of the Philadelphia Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy and the Asia Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy. So she's helping to spread the good word of emotionally focused therapy to the Asia continent. And we're so blessed to have her on our show again today. Um, thank you back, Dr. Ting Lu, for being on our show. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be back. Yay. <laughs> so guys, um, we're going to talk about today um, kind of this sense of using silence in therapy as well as micro expressions. So, you know, EFT can be quite nuanced and sometimes you have lots of moments of silence, even if you're not using EFT, silence can enter in. So we're going to talk about the use of silence and micro expressions, um, which are, well, and we'll have Dr. Ting Lu talk more about that. But um, with micro expressions, they're really, when you have clients that don't emote a lot and you have to try to really tune in, kind of that gestaltish <laughs> type of therapy. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so um, Ting, why don't you start us off and talk a little bit about um, micro, micro expressions, why they're important, why it's important to read the body, and then we'll, we'll feather in silence as we go through this. Yeah. Um I think microexpression is a hot uh, terminology because the TV show lied to me. So now everybody is talking about it. Oh. And yeah, so um, it's about the story of uh, Paul Ackman. And so, but I want to talk a little bit about microexpression because by definition, it's just a very brief facial expression that only lasts a fraction of a second. And it's involuntary. So nobody can uh, control or hide them completely, but then it's either happen as a result of conscious suppression or unconscious repression, right? Mm -hmm. And then because it is involuntary, so you actually expose a person's true emotions. Mm -hmm. So that's the definition of microexpression. So in a way, it almost sounds like you're saying that microexpression is a physical manifestation of a reactive emotion that mm -hmm. somebody may not even be aware that they're giving, but usually it's pretty automatic and it's a response to something, but rather than being overtly or obviously expressive about it, it might just be like in the way they glint their eye or mm -hmm. they smirk their nose or twitch mm -hmm. their, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then also, I think it only happened in human society because in the process of socialization, we learn about the display rules, right? So what's the uh, what's allowed to express in certain culture or certain situation? So we learn to conceal our expression, right? Mm -hmm. But then, so now what we see from people or from clients' face may be a modification of their true expression. Mm -hmm. So that make micro expression more important because that's our, like you said, that's our automatic reaction. Wow, I really like how you said that. That's really important about culture, how some cultures, you know, really are very restrictive about emotional expression. And so people do contain and conceal a lot. And mm -hmm. so it's their micro expression that might give them away. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I want to talk, I think that the purpose today is to talk about how to use that in therapy with mm -hmm. our client, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think to be realistic, we are really busy in therapy. We, you know, as a couple of therapists, we have two clients that we need to maintain the balance and neutral alliance with. We, they, they each have different story to tell. We have to process a lot of information. We have to case conceptualize. And then we have to pay attention to their emotional cue. Yeah. So that's really a lot of tasks that we have to perform simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So to be blunt, I think we are too busy to put, pay 100% attention to detect one's microexpression. I think that's a realistic yes. comment from my experience. Yes. So what I, I don't know if you agree, but what I usually do is 
um, I don't try to figure out what's the real expression there, but I think I pay attention to anything that has changed or anything that may be different. I may, be, I may not be able to explain what I pick up or I may not be able to identify what's the difference, but I notice there's a difference. I think that's probably as much as I can do you know, with all those tasks that I'm trying to perform. Yeah, and I think too with noticing, I like how you use the word noticing. I think for, in the therapy session, it's so validating to hear you talk about how busy we are because seriously, <laughs> that is mm -hmm. so true, you know, and, and I often talk about that dual process that the therapist is going through to be present but simultaneously not present because you're, you know, okay, where am I in the model? I'm conceptually what's happening in front of me. Okay. But I need to be present with you and catch it as it's coming at me. And it's, Oh my gosh, it takes a lot of brain power. But with micro expression, I think you're more likely to see it in the cultures that don't use a lot of words or with withdrawers that aren't very emotive. You know, you're less likely to see it in the really escalated uh, type A personalities that are very expressive and very out loud. They're pretty open, but, and you know, as you get into step stage two, it's gonna be probably a lot easier because you're going a little bit slower to pay attention and notice those micro expressions. But I like how you said, you kind of notice something's different. And if you're somebody, if you have a client in your chair that you know doesn't talk a lot, doesn't use a lot of words, you're probably gonna start to cue into little, changes in their facial expressions like oh I just asked them this and they didn't say anything but I saw their eyebrow raise or I saw them just slightly pull back you know just very very faint little little yeah. stuff yeah or or even just a look you know like the way they look at you or there's a pause and I think that you're right that for a stage one when the cycle is still escalating um, we see a lot of expression from pursuer but then we actually don't see a lot of expression of vulnerability from pursuer at stage one. Mm -hmm. right? so, so they may express a lot of feeling and we thought that's all the feelings they have, but then I think they actually hide their vulnerable feelings. Yes. So I think it's a different strategies to work with pursuer versus a withdrawer, right? Withdrawer is like there's nothing, there's no information for you to work with. Yes. For pursuer, they give you a lot of information, but those are the protective, you know, like the protect, protective, you know, strategies they use to hide their vulnerability. Mm -hmm. That's so right. I love how you say that. That's absolutely right. We think that they're really giving us their true nature because they're emoting all over the place, mm -hmm. but oftentimes mm -hmm. they're, you know, it's that soup of secondary and it's not really their mm -hmm. primary emotions that we're getting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that, you know, like go back to what I said, that because we're so busy, I may only notice that, oh, that the client look different or there is something that change in their expression. So what I usually would do is that I will stop the conversation and then I share my observation by saying that I noticed that when I was talking about this or when you were talking about this, that there's a different look on your face. Did you notice that? Or can you help me understand what happened? Right, so I don't know anything specific, but I can share that there is something happening and invite them to help me. So which will be collaboration with the client. I really like that. And as you're saying that, I'm having this curveball come out that I can hear the client saying, well, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then that's, that's usually what happens is that they, I, I, don't, I didn't notice or I don't know what happened, right? And then I may describe my observation. You know, I would say, you know, as I was talking about how, um, how much you take care of yourself or how, how much you're used to taking care of yourself, I noticed that you've stopped or am I getting it right or I'm reading it too much? So. That's also important to give the client some sense of control that they can correct us or they can deny instead of just saying that, oh, you must feel something. So I think that's the other thing I always pay attention is that I don't want to make assumption to assume that everybody wants to be more aware of their emotion. Right. Yeah. 
So what if, so you do, so when you stop the conversation, you say, I noticed this happened and you do describe it to them, but then they still mm-hmm. say, oh, well, you know, I don't really know. Mm-hmm. Where would mm-hmm. you go with that? Well, if they say, I don't really know, I think I would back off a little bit that we still need to remember to validate, right? And then I really see that I don't know as a survival strategies or a coping strategy they use. So mm-hmm. that's how I validate is that, well, you know, I, it makes sense to me that you don't know, right? And then, and then I think that's what you usually deal with difficult situation in life. Is that correct? So Can I- you I have that a little bit more? Cause that's fascinating. Because, well, um, so I, I think what I see that I don't know, there is this assumption is that people learn without knowing or they're just conditioned into shutting it down or becoming detached from their emotion. So in a situation where, you know, we are stranger to their life and we even feel angry or we feel the pain and for them not to know it, it must not be true, right? So, so this is the theory of emotion regulation is that as long as there are triggers, there must be emotional reaction. Whether or not people are aware of it or they are willing to admit it is a different story. Right. Right. So that's how I come in is that I see trigger, right? I have this client, the wife told the husband that the wife had an emotional affair and then she wanted to leave the marriage. So she turned to the husband, not in anger, but in some kind of just hopelessness, right? She said, well, you know, living, you know, we were married for four years and living with you was like living in dead water, right? There's no wave, no taste, no fun. And I am dying inside. And I don't think I can live like this anymore, right? She was very serious. So as a stranger, I was like, oh my God, that was so hurtful to, for, to hear someone say that to you, right? And then so when I turn to the husband, I say, you know, when your wife say this, and then you hear the hopeless, hopelessness in her voice, what happened to you? He said, I don't know. Okay, and then he, he is stonewalling and there's no expression on his face. So for us as a, a EFT therapist, we know that there must be something because the stimuli was so clear, the rejection, right? The invalidation, the denial of their relationship. And then, you know, even his existence was, was so clear, right? But then he said, I don't know. So this is what I come in is that the I don't know is for self-protection, right? But like if he is in contact with his feeling, it will be too painful. That's the assumption based on, you know, emotion regulation. I love that. That is so perfect. You, you really just captured that in a way that I think goes a bit deeper. Um, and a lot of us do find that so often this, I don't know, I don't know. And it does feel like a defense mechanism, like a plan of escape. Like, I don't want to talk about this because this is so uncomfortable, even though, you know, their, their partner just, verbally punch them in the stomach and you're thinking how could you not react to that how could you not have a feeling you know and and you said you know if they were in contact with their emotions it would be too painful so they've learned to detach to not be in contact as a survival strategy that makes so much sense wow and then also i think that helped me resume my empathy without pushing him or like poking him too hard. Because if we sort of assume that they're just not uh, wanting to be aware or they're being defensive, we may come in too strongly, right? But then if we see that as a survival mechanism, then we understand and we can resume empathy and be more gentle with them. So right. I think that that's where I will start. And then in terms of clinical strategies, you know, when it, like the survival mechanism is my case, my conceptualization of the situation, right? But then there's a way that to intervene is that we still need to remember to validate. You know, I, I cannot assert enough about how important validation is, especially when someone is being defensive and they're, you know, like they're experiencing this kind of life and death situation. I would really 
try to validate and say, you know, it actually doesn't surprise me why you don't know, right? Because when you hear this statement from her, that when you see the look on her face, right, you really don't want to know how you feel, right? It would be too much. Is that correct? that it's better not to know. Mm. So see if they would take that. And then if they say, um, yeah, it's better not to think about it, then bingo, right? So then we know for sure this is a strategy. It's not about they right. don't have a feeling. So once you validate it though, how do you get underneath the strategy? I mean, will validation be enough to get them to drop their guard a little bit to let you peek behind the wall or I mean what how would you proceed from there well I, I sometimes I will do some reflection you know or we call the evocative reflection is that I will repeat what the wife just said I said so when she said that she's dying inside and living with you was no fun it was really painful that when you hear her say that that you don't want to know your feeling, right? And you may not even want to explore that, right? And I say, so help me understand here is that how did you keep yourself away from that? How did you keep yourself not to allow those messages to sort of uh, go in? Like, how did you do it, mm. right? So this is a clearly a evocative reflection and an evocative questioning. I said, how, when you hear this, how did you manage not to be in touch with it or not to have any reaction? Mm. Or sometimes I will use my own reaction as a, another way to evoke. I would just say, even as a stranger sitting here, I feel like my stomach sort of tighten when I hear that. So how did you manage not to do that or not to have that reaction? Yeah, and sometimes they may say, oh, I don't know, I just do it. Or, okay. you know, and it'll, of course you can validate, yeah, it's such an automatic process. You're mm -hmm. so doing it. You mm -hmm. don't have to mm -hmm. think about it. And in other cases, I like this strategy because I often, because then you can kind of put that into the cycle. Oh, so when you hear these things that might ordinarily trigger this feeling inside, you move away from it. You don't allow yourself to be impacted by doing you know, and a lot mm -hmm. of times they'll say, oh, I just busy myself with something else. You know, I just mm -hmm. find myself mm -hmm. like the task. I go in the other room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's excellent. So that in the EFT turn, that's how we put it back to the cycle. And then, and then we can present like whenever he move away or whenever he show no reaction, it just made his partner more frustrated and the partner end up having to poke harder to get a reaction because he just feel like they don't care. Right. So that's how we put it back to the cycle. And then I will come back. Maybe I can use some empathic conjecture. And I will also, I can use some empathic conjecture is that, but then when you move away or when you, you know, sort of stay in the room without continuing the conversation, you know, I wonder if there is a little bit um, discomfort. Like if I come out, if I continue this conversation with her, it will be too much. Is that there's a, a little bit of discomfort there, right? So I start with the very light words. I won't say there is a, a fear or then, you know, you know, being hurt. That may be too strong for people like that. So I start with very like light words like discomfort or that made you feel uncomfortable or that sort of may upset you or frustrate you a little bit or even use pressure, right? So you may like maybe too much. So then I can follow that with the conjecture. That's really good. So I hear you saying that, you know, when they say, I don't know, or they move away and you're, then now you're, we're kind of talking about trying to move a little bit into the emotions that might be there. And one of the strategies you use to explore that um, would be um, empathic conjecture, um, and, and you might use light words. I like that because it feels like, or I get the sense of, and I often hear other therapists kind of get stuck where they feel like they have to go right for the 
primary emotion word. And a lot of times it is too strong, especially in early stage one. And the client just won't bite at it. They're just like, yeah, whatever, you know. But it feels like if we use the light words, then it's too cognitive and it's not really getting to the emotions. But, and I know in one of our previous videos, you talked about don't get into a power struggle with them over the words. If that's their word, we as the therapists know what that means, but just allow them to use that word that leads into their experience. And then, so then as you start to walk around in that and go a little bit deeper, what are some of the things that you might say to move from discomfort or uncomfortable to something a little bit deeper? Well, I think that's, that's where really the strategies I tend to use is I will move in gradually. So I will use a lot of evocative responding with the conjecture, with the reflection and validation all together. So for example, if they bite, right, they say, yeah, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. So that's somewhere, it's better than I don't know. Yeah. Right. And I just said, okay, that's good. So, so when you stay in your room and then you don't want to continue the conversation because you know it made you feel uncomfortable. And then I may use some physiological connection. Like I was also, what happened to you when you feel that discomfort? Like, did you feel like that, that your stomach was tightened or you feel you're, you're, you're sweating or anything that you would notice that, about that discomfort, right? So I connect. The, the, it, the little bit of emotion with their physiological reaction. So that's one part. Right. Or some people will say, well, I don't know. I would just play a video game or I would just listening to music, right? And I, so then you know that playing video game or listening to music become another coping strategies. They try to avoid the conversation, mm -hmm. right? But I would just say, so how does listening to music help? See, I usually come in as using all those as the strategies for them to survive, not as a flaw. Like right. they are they are defective, that they can only run away into the video game. I use I really look at this as a survival strategies. Right. And I think that's part of where we get frustrated or stuck in session two is because just as they even describe that process of moving away, well I just go play video games, which I hear so much, or I go onto my mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, we feel them even avoiding in the conversation, oh, well, I just play video games, you know, and then it kind of shuts down, it feels like it shuts down the conversation and they've just put a door in our face that, you know, they're saying, don't walk through that. And I love how you say, well, how does that help? I really love that. That's a great question. Yeah. And then also, the other thing I may also ask is to go with their loins. You know, it's like, you know, if, for example, they say, oh, I just play video game and say, how does that help? They say, well, then I don't have to think about it. And then I don't have to, I can block her voice out or um, uh, I can concentrate on something. Mm -hmm. I say, so that help, right? I help you that, that distract you, that take your mind off that horrible conversation that just happened, that you really don't want to go back and think about that, right? So then that's a reflection of, the information I just had, then I was zoom in with the attachment longing and the attachment fear is I was just say, for example, that, so what will happen? What will happen if you don't stay with your video game? What will happen that, you know, that you can never imagine going to her and share with her that it really hurt to hear that, right? You can never imagine to do that because it would not be safe or it would not help. It may just invite more criticism or she's just going to say more hurtful things to you. Is that correct? So that's not really a character, but on a deeper level. Really love that. That's so good. This is really, really good stuff because that often, you know, and sometimes I'll even use that as a, as a little bit of a cue to you know, because they try to make it sound on the outside, oh, it's not so bad, I just tune it out, no big deal. But you know that they're not avoiding because a good thing is happening. You know they're avoiding because there's a negative stimulus. So mm -hmm. I can kind of leverage that to say, oh, you know, yeah, you're avoiding because this is something, something bad is happening mm -hmm. over here, something uncomfortable. 
And mm-hmm. that, that's also, you know, the same kind of doorway. I love how you say that. What, what would happen? Could you imagine if you didn't stay with your video game, if you didn't go to your computer or your office or the gym, what would happen? I love that. That's an excellent strategy. Right. And also going to the fear is that they can never imagine going to their partner mm-hmm. and then they can share their pain and then they will get comforted or it will help with the situation. Right. They can never imagine that happening. Like yeah. for them, like if I expose myself or if I move forward, then I will get more criticism and I will get hurt even you know, worse. And then would that be kind of the enactment that you would try to set up is it's hard, you know, for me to imagine going to you. I, I'm worried that there might be more hurt that would come as a result. Well, I think it depends on client's reaction because sometimes um, I may do a little bit more validation and reflection to ask them, so what happened to you as I was saying that, right? What happened to you when I talk about like you can never imagine going to her or, or even go to the internal working model that in your whole life, nobody has invited you or, or teach you to show you that you could do that, mm-hmm. right? You don't have good experience whenever right, you try to share your feelings. So of course that you don't want to go there. Right. So even, well, of course, even before you set up the enactment, I love how you're saying you really heighten that. And I know the word is heightened, but to me, it feels like a deepening of that experience, like really sitting them in it, getting them Mm -hmm. in it and really expanding it in a, in a deeper kind of way. And that's so beautiful. I love how you say that, you know, that nobody's ever invited you into this. And, and that just resonates with me so much because I have so many clients where that's mm-hmm. not been the case, you know, and, and it's not even like an ethnic culture. Sometimes it's a geographic culture. You know, you have, you know, the real mm-hmm. traditional manly men that come from certain parts of the U S where, you know, like New York or they're outdoorsy kinds of guys. And you don't mm-hmm. talk about your feelings. You drink mm-hmm. beer and go hunting or play sports instead, you know, so to talk about their internal experience. And these are the kinds of people that I'll say, I don't have emotions. <laughs> no, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, yeah. and the culturally it's not allowed, right? It, it doesn't fit their gender roles. So mm-hmm. it makes a lot of sense that they do that. But I think you raise a very good question is about, is this a good timing to do enactment? Right. And I think that uh, before I do enactment, I would test the temperature a little bit from the other partner because if, if you remember the sequence of the event is the, the partner shoot a bullet and we have to deal with this with right. the reaction and we finally draw something out, right? And then we can help the withdrawer access some feeling, but pursuer is still not safe, right? The pursuer will just shoot a bullet at them. So this is the time I will go back to check in with the pursuer and then make sure that they are not still in the attacking mode. Right. Make sure they put their uh, metaphorical gun away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I will really check in with the pursuer to make sure that they can respond to the withdrawer's uh, new experience in a more um, empathic way. Yeah. I encourage the withdrawer to enact. Otherwise, you know, I, I, I have enactment turned badly before and then I'm, I feel really bad, you know, and then, you know, we have to deal with that. So if it's early stage one and you haven't done many enactments, of course, you're going to want to um, test the water, see the enactment, kind of mm-hmm. shore up the pursuer to make sure that, that as soon as you have the withdrawal, share a little bit that, you know, the pursuer isn't going to jump all over that and shoot more bullets because that would be dangerous. So, you know, you want to make sure that... And oftentimes I find too, as you, as you expand this experience with the withdrawer, sometimes it can be soothing enough that the pursuers had time to their nervous Mm -hmm. system to come back down. And oftentimes they're like, yes, I want them to share so badly. I wish they would come back into this conversation. I want so much for that, you know, so yeah. Well, if we have a pursuer react this positively, and of course I'm just going to set up an enactment right away because what would be a better you know, moment to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the other way that this, this may go, which is when, you know, you're trying to conjecture and get these reactions and you get silence. Mm-hmm. How much, I mean, and I've seen this happen too, is that 
you know, when there is silence in the cycle, especially at home, oftentimes the pursuer will fill up the silence mm-hmm. and they start loading up what they think is happening for their other mm-hmm. partner. And then of course they get more and more silent. It's like, well, I can't say anything that's going to make this better. How much silence is too much silence or what are we supposed to do with the silence? How long do we let it go before we jump in or mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, one thing I do notice is that, you know, the other partner has, you know, lower tolerance of silence than we do. So if we let the, t- the silence go on for too long, usually we set up the cycle, like you said, the pursuer will jump in and try to push or try to fill in the gap, right? Mm-hmm. So this is the time that you will become like um, the cycle enacting in session. Yeah. So, so if there is a silence, I would probably, you know, talk to the pursuer first and I just say, so is this what usually happens at home is that whenever there's a conflict that you try to um, communicate, but then there's this silence. And then if the pursuer says yes, and I just, can you let me, like, give me some, some time to figure this out and, you know, find out what really happened here. Like, just be patient with me. So I was sort of put the pursuer at the place and letting them know that I'm doing something to help them. Otherwise, they may be destructive, right? So then, sure. Go ahead. Oh, and then I will turn to the silent partner. Usually, um, usually I will allow the silence to go on a little bit longer if I feel that the client is struggling or um, they are more in touch with their emotion, then I would not give them the space and time to be there. So I don't see that as silence. I see that as just giving them space. Right. And that's what kind of what I was going to say is as you say this, I kind of what popped up for me is two different mm-hmm. kind of silent strategies. And one you just mentioned is not so much silence, but space for them to organize and try to, you know, figure out their experience. But then I have this other kind of silence where the withdrawer may say, I don't know, and then they're silent, and it seems like they're thinking about it for a second. But then the silence goes on, and you kind of see this thing happen to their face where it's like they figured it out, and now they're looking at you, and it's almost like a protest. Like, I refuse to answer that. I'm going to stonewall you and see how long this can go on until you give up and go away <laughs> like a Mexican standoff. Nope. Yeah. I'm not going to say anything. So well, then, then you're right. Then that becomes a power struggle, right? They're, they're testing us to see what we will do. Are we going to become another pursuer or are we going to become their friend? Right? So this is a critical moment that usually I give the control back to them. That if I notice that they they sort of figure it out or they have something that they are holding back and not wanting to share. And I will ask them, I say, you know, I ask you a question and then I know it makes sense that it takes you some time to think about this. So what would you like me to do here? Do you want me to keep asking you a question or you want me to drop this topic or you want me to give you more space? So what would you like me to do? Hmm. And what if they say, I want you to drop it? Okay. I just say, okay. So I think it's important for me to drop it because you don't like me to pressure you. Is that right? Right. And then, and then at home, is that what you also want your partner to do is to drop the topic whenever you become silent? And then we put it right back into the cycle and show how. That's right. That's right. And at least he has to say it, right? He has to admit that whenever I use silence, it's really a stop sign to tell you that stop. Right. Right. And then, then I will go back to the cycle and say, so is that a successful strategy? Does she get it? Or did you get what you were asking for? Right. That's really good because I think the, the little fear that popped up in my mind when you're saying that is that if I do drop it, is that I'm kind of enabling that process to continue. Mm-hmm. And that's not the process we want mm-hmm. to happen. But I like how you pop it back into the cycle and then bring it back to, you know, did that get you what you wanted? <laughs> you know, was that successful? And that, that paints itself, you know. That's right. And then he has to say, well, she doesn't get it or she doesn't care. 
or you know she wants she likes things her way so whatever i want doesn't matter that's a lot of information mm -hmm. for yeah. us to to go back in the game right yeah usually i find that what's at the root of that silence when they sort of dig in is more of that whatever i say is going to be met with criticism or i'm going to be right. what's wrong so i might as well not say anything it's just easier to be quiet <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's safer. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I, I think that when this is what I really learned is that I look at the silent withdrawer or someone who use silence to protest and get into the power struggle with us or with, with the therapist or with their partner is that I will give them the sense of control they need. Mm -hmm. Because if I keep pushing them, they're just going to dig their heel and then, you know, they can, they can do whatever they want by like, right. us. So I think giving them the sense of control and then really be respectfully just curious. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I, I will make my intent very clearly that um, I, I won't force you. And then I want you to call the shot. But I also want to be helpful to you. So help me understand how is this going to help you or, or, um, how is like how, how what do you usually do at home when you want the topic to be dropped so mm -hmm. help me understand here so that's make really, my really clear yeah i i love that it's really amazing and it reminds me of something they say to us um in the trainings is about we don't want to take someone's defenses away from them we want to hand them to them so i like when you say i don't want to try to strip that control away from them because then it, it can also damage the alliance and they don't feel safe. And then I, then like a lot of therapists say, I feel like I'm joining the pursuer and becoming the pursuer of the witch mm -hmm. are, which is also dangerous. And I love your strategies that, you know, if this, if you kind of um, are able to ascertain that this silence has gone from or shifted from, I'm trying to figure this out to now I'm avoiding and so I'm just going to do like a Mexican standoff and I refuse to say anything and see where this is going to go. You lean in and say, okay, I notice it seems like there is something that, you know, you were thinking about and mulling over, but maybe you're not sharing it. Help me understand what you would like here. Would you like me to back off? Do you need more space to continue figuring this out? Do you want me to ask you more questions? Mm -hmm. um, and if they do say, you know, I want you to drop it, you say, okay, I, I don't want to push this. I want to, you know, respect, is this what happens when something becomes, you know, a hot or a, you know, an uncomfortable situation at home, you get silent and then you really wish your partner to back off and you just put it right back into the cycle. I love that. That's perfect. And then the other thing I also find, I, I, I will also try to balance the, um, the the big, big victimizing mode that they have because when someone has to use silence to fight, oftentimes they see themselves as being very small. Like this is my passive way of protecting myself. But from the pursuer's perspective, the silent partner is the powerful one because they can jump up and down, they can cry their eyes out and get no response. Right. So this is the cycle I will also put in is that this is really sad that whenever it happened, both of you feel powerless. Right. The, the silent partner sort of feel like I have no voice in this relationship. I can only hide or keep my mouth shut in order to survive. Whereas the pursuing partner may feel like I have to work so hard and push so hard and this person get to decide if I deserve and response. So that's the negative impact of the cycle is that they both feel small and they both feel powerless in the relationship. And in their eyes, the other partner is so powerful. Mm. That's such a, ah, oh, I love that. It's such a good strategy. And, and I love the way that you put that. And I think that's so helpful um, because we really do get lost I think a lot of times when silence comes up and we feel kind of remiss what to do with it, you know, I think for the most part, we've learned a little bit of, okay, can we sit here long enough and maybe explore what, you know, can I help you explore? But, you know, when it goes on too long, it's hard to know, what do I do? How do I bring this back to the cycle? 
how do I organize this and make sense of it? Because again, it's easier, seems easier for us to work with stimuli rather than the absence of stimuli. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. wow. Wow. Thank you so much. Team. You know, this was so helpful and I'm, you know, I often go back and rewatch these episodes myself and take notes. This was so good. This was so helpful. Now you offer trainings, right? Yeah. We have a externship coming in Philadelphia in March, and then people can visit Philadelphia Center for EFP.org website to see the date and the location of the externship. And there's also another, actually I'm doing an infidelity workshop in Pittsburgh. That's mm -hmm. February 22nd. So uh, people can go to ISTEP website and find the training information. Excellent. And if people want to contact you and maybe have you come do a masterclass, maybe on, you know, cultural competency and EFT or, you know, like micro expression silence. I mean, you just have so much uh, knowledge and wisdom around this topic that I think people would really love to bring you out and, and have you teach a class. Can they, can they get in touch with you and have you do that? Yeah, if you contact the Philadelphia Center for EFT.org website, they have a contact form that you can reach me. Perfect, perfect. So and I'm going to put all of that information, uh, the link to the website in the description for this video. Now, do you have a personal website aside from the Philadelphia EFT website? No, the, I have a Chinese website, that's asiaeft.com, but I don't think that would be too helpful. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you do speak, you know, one of the Asian languages, then that might be helpful. <laughs> yeah. And if they're traveling, they can certainly come see you as well. Yes, and I also do training in Singapore in English. So people on the different side of the world, maybe they want to go to Singapore and see me there. Hey, that would be a great vacation. That would be a tax write-off. Yeah, and then you will be in a 90 degree. That would be nice compared <laughs> to are in Philadelphia. That would be fun. Learn EFT in Singapore. Oh my gosh, that's excellent. Now, do yeah. you have any publications or training videos that are available on the Philadelphia EFT website? Well, I only produce training tape in Mandarin because there is so much English material available. Mm -hmm. So hopefully one day I will have time to do that. But uh, so far, I only produce uh, training tape in Mandarin. And we have one new coming this June. So uh -huh. people who see Mandarin will have more um, training tape to watch. Well, hopefully one of those can be, um, what do you say? Subtitle. Yeah, I don't know why my, my brain isn't working right now, but you can subtitle it in English because you are fabulous and we learn so much from you. So that would be great. So make sure you put that on the to-do list. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much for the interview. And I'm glad that to share some of my experience with people. And thank you for um, the opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you guys for staying tuned and make sure that you check out a couple of the other episodes that Tina and I have done on uh, the series as well as the other videos with some of the other trainers and make sure that you hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Thanks guys.